Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? And station's ready. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Got you loud and clear. Great. Please stand by for opening remarks. Hi, my name is Steve Schultz, and I'm the astronomy teacher at Wheat Ridge High School, Jeff Co. Public Schools in beautiful Wheat Ridge, Colorado. We welcome everyone to today's downlink with the space station. We are the farmers, and today the farmers are going to space. Here's our first question. Hi, I'm Talia, and my question is, what's your favorite thing to do in microgravity? Well, thanks for throwing me the softball, I'll tell you. That's an easy question. My favorite thing to do is float. Uh, everywhere you go, it's kind of like being a superhero, just being able to uh, not have to touch the ground and move around with ease in space all the time. And also look out the window. Hi, my name is Bobby. My question was, what made you want to become an astronaut? Hey, Bobby, I think for me it was a sense of both exploration and then trying to figure out how things work. So I was really uh, interested in science and math as a, in the elementary school and being taking things apart, understanding what made them work, and the idea of finding and ex understanding new things. And so being an astronaut was a logical extension of that, trying to explore uh, new places and then also a further understanding of science that helps people on Earth. Hi, my name is Anna, and my question for you is, why do astronauts get weaker in space? Hey, Anna, there's a few things that cause that effect. One is the fact that there's less gravity up here. Uh, a part of it's uh, attributed to radiation, and a part of it's just the stress on your body of being in a different environment. So the, the microgravity part is our bodies and our bones aren't taking the same load that they would on, on the ground. And so like your spine and your, your lower bones aren't compressed like they are on the ground. The radiation, we don't have the uh, ionosphere to protect us from the radiation that you do on the Earth. And so we see a little higher level of radiation here. Uh, but all those effects are actually really similar to aging it just happens to us faster and so one of the reasons they do a lot of research on us uh, as people up here on the space station is both to understand long duration trips to the moon to stay and to mars but also there's a lot of applications for aging uh, and bone loss uh, diseases on the earth there's a lot of the same things that work for us uh, have the possibility to help people on earth as well hi my name is glory and my question is what was the hardest adjustment for you to make to space life Uh, I think for me, it's uh, just the idea of it's very, as you can see, looking around, there's stuff everywhere. And so trying to process all that when you're used to not seeing things on the ceiling and on the walls where you live on the earth, trying to understand that there's things everywhere. And, and it takes a while for your brain to adapt to that. So that was, I think, for me, that took the longest uh, to realize I could utilize all those surfaces and to naturally uh, expect that versus being sort of disoriented at first. Hi, my name is Zariah, and my question is, do you ever forget what gravitational force feels like when you're in space? That's actually that's a really good question, Zariah. Uh, so the yes and no. So I think uh, your brain adapts to what's up here, but that also means you sort of forget gravity. And so uh, one of the common things that happen when people, when people get back uh, is, you know, letting go of something and forgetting that it's going to fall. And so we get in the habit up here of just letting, you know, like this microphone or a pen or a pencil or whatever I'm working on, uh, turning away and doing something and expecting it to be right there. Uh, and so when we come back to Earth, uh, your brain, it happens pretty quickly, um, but uh, it's not uncommon for people to drop things, forgetting that things are going to fall to the ground. Um, and then you also do... Uh, your brain and your body sort of forget how to keep the fluid down in your in your legs. Uh, and so that's also something when you come back that gravity takes care of and your brain and your digestive system all have to readapt to having gravity again. Hi, my name is Blake Neb. My question was, what's the best and worst thing you've eaten up in space? 
So Blake, the, the best thing I've had up here was actually we grew some, uh, as part of our plant science, we grew some hatched chili peppers. Uh, we actually didn't have a whole lot to do with growing them, but we got to harvest them and eat them. And so we had an amazing taco night uh, with fresh, fresh hatched chili peppers. So that was probably the best thing we've had up here. And then from time to time, we get fresh food set up. I would say the, the worst food isn't uh, pretty much everything. I've been surprised by how good it is. One thing that happens in space is your sense of taste is decreased a little bit. Um, on Earth, just the natural flow of air brings the 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 smell if you will into your nose so you get the smell plus the taste on your tongue and that doesn't happen as much in space so what we do is put a lot of condiments on things up here uh, to add flavor to the food but by and large uh, pretty much everything that's packed for us uh, we enjoy eating my name is edwin and i'm wondering how the semicircular canal fluid in your head is affected in a microgravity environment So Edwin, that's a, a, a really insightful question. So your, your vestibular system, which is what we use to, to detect motion, uh, your brain actually ties together your ear and your eyes. And so what happens when we get to space is it gets really confused and that can lead to some disorientation early on. And so the part uh, of the vestibular system that senses gravity, uh, the otolith organs, those don't sense gravity up here. They're, they get really confused. They don't know which way is down. The semicircular canals actually work the same in the sense that fluid is still shifting. So if I move towards the camera and then back away from the camera or left and right, I still, that fluid still shifts and I still get the sense of acceleration and deceleration. But since I can do it in any axis, it takes a while for my brain to dissociate what it's getting as a visual input from what my ears are telling it. And that's what can lead people to get space sick early on when we get up here and when we come back. Um, and then uh, very much like a, just like an iPad or device, like on the ground, you'd expect as I move this around, it would reorient the picture. But so our ears are just like the, the gyros and accelerometers and these devices. They can tell there's motion, but without a, a way to know which way is down, they get confused until eventually your brain adapts up here and it starts using your eyes more and using that for orientation. Hi, my name is Bonnie. And my question is, how do you adjust to being back on Earth after being in space for a long period of time? So, Bonnie, it takes us a few days uh, to be able to just function normally on the ground. And for a lot of this, the reasons I was talking about, uh, your body has to get reused to the blood going back down to your legs, and you have to add fluid to your body, so you're really dehydrated at first. Uh, all, that thing I was, all those things I was talking about with your ears. So if you imagine uh, the first time you try to drive in a car, it's a while before we're allowed to drive, because if you go around in a corner in a car, when you first come back to Earth, all those sensations of sitting still, but the ear fluid shifting in your semicircular canals, that's not something that we're used to after having been up here for a while, so that can also be very disorienting. So your brain has to readapt to what it's seeing versus what it's feeling as you move your head and your body around. Uh, it takes uh, a few, about a week to, for your brain to adjust to that, and then it can take a few months for your bones and your body to actually get back to a normal state in terms of bone density and strength uh, as the muscles and bones reacclimate to being in 1G. One, one Hi, my name is Aisha. My question is, do you have to stay in a certain calorie limit while on missions in space? So actually, there's a whole team of people that uh, help us with that, Aisha, uh, of nutritionists on the ground at Johnson Space Center that work specifically on that, both to keep us healthy, but also as, uh, as further research. So some of us actually eat different kinds of food up here, and we try to get a better sense of what food and nutrients uh, best help protect against bone loss. It's actually a pretty complicated balance. It's, I've never paid more attention to what I eat than I have up here in terms of what's in it. And uh, you know, things that you think would help can actually have uh, bad effects and so it's this constant balance of you know enough protein to have bone and muscle gain but not so much that it's acidic and causes muscle and bone loss um, you know you're balancing calcium fat all these different parts uh, to make sure that we're continuing to to be able to develop muscle and bone up here uh, and also maintain our weight because your body sheds a lot of its water weight when you first get up here um, because it's not it senses that uh, when the water comes up into your head that you need to get rid of it and so there's uh, a lot of people working to figure that out and, and keep us safe and uh, and healthy up here Hi, my name is Ryan. My question is, what is the coolest thing you've seen from the space station? Uh, so I think the coolest thing I've seen is Antarctica. Uh, I think what's uh, uh, a close second is the Aurora, which the 
cool thing about that is you get to see it pretty much every day if you want. And so when we're at the farthest north and farthest south ports of our orbit in a night pass, if you look towards the polar regions of the Earth, uh, you get pretty much an amazing show. It's kind of like sitting around a campfire at night uh, on the Earth. It's the same thing. You sit out the, with the crewmates and just look out the window and watch that mesmerizing show. Um, and, uh, and then getting to see Antarctica uh, is something I'd never seen. And the Air Force is a pilot. I've seen lots of parts of the world from the air, but I'd never seen Antarctica. So that was pretty cool to see in person up here. My name is Brielle, and my question is, what were some of the biggest reasons you chose to go up into space? So, Bree, for me, it goes back to sort of the reason I became an astronaut to begin with, and that's really science. The, the space station is an orbiting laboratory, uh, and we're doing about 300 experiments while we're up here. And so, it's it's for me, it's just about uh, trying to find new technology, new materials, uh, new methods, uh, and new things about our bodies that can help people on Earth. So that's really, for me, why it's worth uh, being gone for my family to be up here is uh, all the benefits to the people on Earth. Hi, my name is Grant. And uh, what aspect about living in space surprised you the most? I think for me, it's actually how important uh, meals and food are. And part of it's uh, kind of the nutrition part I was talking about. But I think the other part uh, is that people don't think about is the social aspect. And so a really part, important part of long duration flight, especially as we look to going to the moon to stay as part of the Artemis program to Mars, is a long transit time and being with people. And the meal times are the times that not only do we get to socialize with our crewmates, but during the day we're so busy doing work. That's kind of the gathering time, and it's our second family. And so that's when uh, you get really that huge human connection again, and not only do you, is it important socially, but that's also where we share lessons learned from across the day about, you know, different experiments we've been working on or things we, we learned about a particular area uh, so that we can avoid making those mistakes in the future. Hi, my name is Nick Landwehr, and my question is, what has been your crowning achievement or discovery while on the space station? Man, so that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, so the, the really cool thing about the experiments we do is each of those 300 things we're doing is some you know, PhD or some scientist, some engineers crowning achievement for their life. So they've worked you know, years to get their experiment uh, or their uh, you know, research onto the station. And so we get to be a part of so many people's crowning achievements. That's pretty cool. I think for me personally, uh, one of the things uh, that I'm really excited to be a part of is some of the research into being able to recover water as part of a a regeneration cycle. And so, uh, you know, right now we run about 80, 90 ish percent of recovery in terms of the water that comes out of us getting reused and, and, and drunk by us again. And we're trying to test new technologies to get closer to like a high 90 percent of that. And there's ramifications for that for Artemis uh, and exploration to be able to sustain a human presence on the moon and Mars, but even more importantly, on the Earth. I mean, if we could recycle 98 percent of the water we use and excrete, that would be huge. It would be game changing. Uh, we wouldn't have to worry about water shortages and droughts uh, if we could scale that. So I think that's to me what's the most uh, you know, fundamentally human changing thing that, we're, that I'm a part of and proud to be working with uh, at NASA. My name is Haley Redford and my question is, if you could change one thing about your daily life up at the space station, not including bringing a loved one up there with you, what would you change that would make you want to stay up there for longer? All right, so you took away that. The one answer is the one I was going to give. That would have been keeping my family up here. But uh, I guess if I couldn't do that, then the next thing would be more windows, more and bigger windows. That'd be great. Uh, so we have, we do have windows, uh, but they're uh, they're smaller and not in all places because they add mass. Uh, and they added uh, every place you have a window as a potential leak path or potential area of weakness on the structure. But man, if we had some huge uh, bay windows that we could just breeze by all the time, that'd be awesome. Hi, my name is Adrian, and my question was, how does oxygen work in the space station? So, Adrian, we have a few different ways we can get oxygen up here. Um, we basically have a, it's ECLA system, an environmental control system, that includes an oxygen generation system. And so that 
creates oxygen. Uh, and then we also have CO2 scrubbing devices that take the carbon dioxide that we produce back out of the air. Uh, we also can bring up uh, basically oxygen in tanks under pressure that we can use to augment that system. So we keep a lot of that here in reserve in case we have any problems. And then there's actually a chemical method uh, that are uh, on the Russian side of the station that we have a chemical way to generate oxygen also as a reserve method if the normal environmental control system doesn't do that. And you know, part of what we do up here is a test bed for for Artemis uh, and for Moon and Mars missions. So we are constantly checking out and trying new technologies for oxygen generation and regeneration to see if we can apply that and scale that uh, for longer duration, further exploration missions. My name is Itzel Estrada, and my question is, can you breathe the same in space or is it more difficult? So uh, when we're outside the space station, there's no breathing. Uh, if we're on a spacewalk, then we're in the suit. Inside the space station, uh, yeah, even without gravity, there's no difference in, in your breathing. I will say the one thing we were actually just talking about the other night that is a little different is no one snores in space, it seems like. And I think that's because uh, you know when you're laying on your back on Earth uh, and the, uh, your esophagus and tongue uh, fall back from gravity, that doesn't happen. So that's slightly related to breathing, but it's actually easier. And uh, you don't get woken up by uh, your your crewmate snoring next to you. Hi, my name is Vinny, and my question is, how hard is it to do work on the spacecraft? So, Vinny, it's, uh, I, honestly, it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a long work day on the ground. Um, the, the fact that we get to float around and, uh, you know, work on the ceilings and walls makes it go by pretty quick. And the fact that we're doing 300 different experiments in the time we're up here makes the days go by really fast. Also, the days are long, uh, but they go, they, the time flies up here, and it's really fun uh, to be involved in so many different things. I think that's, to me, the most joyful part is every morning uh, having a completely different schedule from the day before and not really knowing uh, what uh, excitement each day might bring. Hi, my name is Martin, and my question for you is what games are fun to play in space? Uh, so I think uh, anything involving a ball uh, is fun to play in space just because there's, uh, it doesn't fall. Uh, so it's, uh, things go in straight line trajectories. Um, the other thing we have found uh, that works out pretty well is uh, you know, uh, dancing in space. Is, uh, you can add all kinds of moves that you definitely wouldn't be able to do on the ground uh, in terms of flips, uh, spins, uh, or anything like that. So um, just about anything you can imagine where gravity would stop you from doing that game on the Earth, it's fun to do in space. Hi, my name is Bianca, and my question for you is, what is your next mission? So Blanca, the, right now we use the International Space Station, like I said, both for a laboratory as well as a proving ground for exploration missions. So, so NASA will continue to maintain a presence in low Earth orbit, uh, but you're seeing a much bigger transition to the private uh, industry taking over low Earth orbit, which is, is part of NASA's charter is to enable that. And that will allow NASA to focus on Artemis and exploring and pushing humans further than we've ever gone before. And so that's kind of uh, the future of NASA. And it's really your generation, the, those of you in high school now, uh, in, you know, in grade school, that are going to be the one that solve and the problems and the find us the solutions that are going to get us to Mars um, and in the near term get us back to the moon to stay. And so that's kind of the next the next step, the next giant leap for NASA that we're working on is Artemis. Hi, my name is Braden and I was wondering, is it easier to see stars and other planets? So, Brayden, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier. You can see more of them. Um, the, without an atmosphere up here, they don't twinkle, and so it's much more clear. Uh, so the moon is still just as far away as it is uh, for you. We're about 200 miles closer, but that's a really small difference. Um, but it's much more clear with the naked eye. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is if you use binoculars or even uh, if you are able to turn down the lights and the windows around you, you can see just a, a really low fuzz, almost like static, just as you look out of the dark black um, from all the stars, the millions and billions of stars out there that you can't actually see as well on the Earth. So it's pretty cool just to, uh, to look and let your eyes focus on that deep black and then realize how many stars are really out there. Hi, my name is River and uh, my question is, what is a zero G like and does it make you nauseous? Uh, so River, it does. Uh, 
uh, it's sort of like that feeling when you are going on a roller coaster and start to fall from the top, where your stomach sort of comes up in your chest. Uh, so that's the feeling you have when the, the second stage cuts off on the rocket. So the, we came up here in an F-9 on a SpaceX rocket. And when that cuts, you get thrown forward and you feel that sensation. Uh, and you do get, you can get nauseous. Um, a lot of us take uh, help, takes motion sickness drugs to help with that uh, early on until your brain can adapt to it. It can also be really hard to fall asleep early on because you, you feel like you're falling all the time. And so trying to fall asleep while your body thinks it's falling is a little hard. Um, so we can also use medications early on for that, but your brain adapts pretty quickly. So within about two or three days, it becomes normal. So I don't feel like I'm falling right now. Um, and then I, the opposite will happen when I come back to Earth. Uh, it's going to feel really weird to, ha to have that sensation of being pulled towards the ground again. Hi, my name is Rachel, and I was wondering what the scariest experience you've had in space was. So, Rachel, I think it's a testament to our training teams uh, at NASA uh, that I haven't really been scared, per se. I think I've been definitely struck by the gravity, no pun intended, of, of the work we've done. So I was able to help uh, my crewmates, Kayla and Tom, go out on a spacewalk. And I think there's definitely something about you know strapping your crewmates into a spacesuit and knowing that uh, the only thing protecting them from space is the work you just did to get them in the suit. So for me, that was significant. Uh, but I wouldn't say uh, we've ever been scared or surprised, and that's really because the ground has done such a good job thinking through all the possible things that could go wrong. Most of our training is, is in off-nominal situations. Uh, the majority of time, things go great. Um, but most of our training is, is focused on what happens when things don't go well, uh, so we're prepared for that and, and ready to, to deal with uh, any, any, any situation. Hi, that was awesome. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us here at Weaverage High School. We appreciate all that you do. You are truly an inspiration for all of us. Thanks very much. Enjoy. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.